live. Hey, hey, everybody. Welcome to Sales Top to Bottom on this glorious, what's today? May 10th. 10th. May 10th. May 10th. I am your host, Keenan, and I'm with the lovely Beck Holland. Beck, why do you have five rings on your hand? Oh, I only four. have four. Why four, they're Beck? My, why? They're my, um, they're my version of brass knuckles. <laughs> Are big you big punching big. people these days, Beck? As, as you know, I talk a big game, but really, I think you described me once as a chihuahua. <laughs> <laughs> So I have to scare Sounds like something I would do. I just, I just scare people, you know, so they don't come at me. Because once they do, I'm like, oh snap! Mm -hmm. <laughs> my, my, my ode to David on uh, uh, Schitt's Creek. Ah, my ode to David. David. Uh, David. David. Yes. yes. <laughs> well, right, with hey, that everybody watching. Wait, before you go, everybody watching. Share. Everybody, put the name of somebody that you think should be watching this into the comments. Let's see if we can get a bigger crowd. Two, because we don't have the mailbox, if you have questions for us in the mailbox section, put them in now so we can see them ahead of time and ask. And we'll answer one or two of your questions in the mail. What do we call it? Mail time? Mailbox. What do we call it? The mailbox. inbox. The inbox. The inbox. Sky's the limit. The inbox. All right. Thank you. 100%. Thank you. Guys, sky's absolute limit. Me, the limit is business. Keenan, personal as well. You can ask anything. <laughs> this year is fooling us to, to trust back. Yeah. Well, with that, we're on to the first segment of this podcast, which is email teardown. This is the segment where Keenan and Beck tear down emails and messages that were sent over to them. Now, on to the first email. This one is titled, uh, Has a sales growth company been in touch with these three journalists? Hi, Keenan. Reaching out from Intelligent Relations with a quick idea for how a sales growth company can see more marketing success for less money in 2023. In short, we've simplified PR so startups like yours can pitch journalists directly and win media coverage in top tier and niche publications. Using our DIY PR platform, you find the right journalists, draft pitches, and personalize them all automatically. To put our code where our mouth is, we ran your company through our algorithms and generated these three idea these ideas for your first three journalists and pitches. What do you think? Three top journalists and pitch ideas for a sales growth company. One, Sari Krieger, Inside Sales Magazine senior editor. She covers topics related to salespeople, sales strategies and tools, and customer success. Pitch idea, a profile of a sales growth company's unique approach to helping companies drive revenue growth through their innovative strategies and tools. Two, Zane D'Souza, Forbes small business contributor. He writes about the challenges of small business owners and how they could succeed in the market by adapting current trends. Pitch idea, an exploration of how a sales growth company is helping small businesses succeed through their innovative practices and techniques. And three, Lisa Rallo from Sales Hacker Magazine contributor. She writes about the latest strategies for selling in the digital age with an emphasis on technologies such as AI, automation, and data science. Pitch idea, how a sales growth company is leveraging these technologies to help businesses drive more revenue growth in a competitive market. Can I offer you a quick demo? You can book, you can book a time here. Speak soon. <gasps> oh, okay. Uh, Keenan, what are your thoughts on this email? That was a long one. Yeah, way. so it was, but and I'm glad you did. So the first thing I'm going to say, it took you two minutes to read it. Think about that for a second. But outside of that, <clears throat> it was long as shit. But it was a good email. That was a good email. Why? Because, one, they gave me examples, right? So she was like, look, here is a, a, a um, uh, uh, writer, a columnist, whatever you call it. Here's a columnist. This is the magazine they write for. This is the topics they write on. So what she's done is she's made, she said, hey, it is difficult to get in front of columns. columns. It is difficult to get PR, right? It's difficult to get people writing for you, starting with who do I write to? You go to the magazine, you got to look them up, or the, or the newspaper, you got to look them up. Either the right writer, you build relationships. So that is hard. So by doing that alone, she was like, oh, hey, I get a problem. I can't get in touch with the right people, right? Two, 
Um, they're the right people in the right space. Three, here's a pitch idea. So all of that good, it, it addressed a problem. I think she she could have done it shorter. I think she could have been more concise. I think she could have called out right in the line, hey, are you having a hard time getting attention from publications? Are you not getting the PR exposure you'd like, right? We can solve it. She started with the problem and then thrown some of that in there. She, um, I, I thought it was a great email. With that, because I actually took a demo. <clears throat> oh, well, with that, Beck, what do you think about this email? I'm I'm uh, shocked that you took a demo. Uh, it's my first. Um, I would have Why? liked uh, just, you know, I don't think you, I didn't think you take many demos. Um, Let's touch agree, on that when you're done. Go. I agree that it should be shorter. I mean, we have a minute left. <laughs> uh, the second thing I'd add is I would try to take a guess at what Keenan is metric on, which is going to be revenue and business growth, I would imagine, as a CEO. And I would find a way to map PR and the root cause of not being able to get in front of PR back to revenue, especially with a statistic. Like I have to do the heavy lifting of mapping them back in my own head. Um, those would be my those would be my my two corrections. I for well, sure. Funny, well, the reason I took the took the demo though, Beck, is because whether she did it on purpose or not, she got to a problem. Right. Like I was reading that and I was like, she's right. And it's funny. Her timing was excellent because we are looking to get more PR and we're talking to people. But See, that's why I think she got your attention. It was luck. She got in people front could of have, people could have written out to me before and said, hey, do you want more PR or something? And I wouldn't have given them the time. But this what got me here was the fact that I was in control of the ability to see who I should reach out to. I can reach out to them, talk to them myself, et cetera. That was intriguing. We do not have a horn, so I'm just gonna ding, 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 ding. <laughs> We're not doing my email today. Uh, uh, today. Uh, we can, we can. However, we will be going way over time. No. Okay. Well, I just said over two. Two. <laughs> well, with that, we are on to the next segment of this podcast, which is. Sales mythology. This is the segment where Beck and Keenan demystify common myths in the sales industry. So the first myth of today is uh, I should fire underperforming reps after 60 days. Beck, what are your thoughts on this one? So I, I want to point of clarity first. Is this reps, do you mean SDRs or do you mean account executives? Either. Um, either uh, you're gonna hate me for this but i don't think it's necessarily a hundred percent a myth in my opinion there are some well i'll unpack it with this france has a law basically that for the first three months it's always a trial and the reason is is once you lock down with a french company it's extremely hard to fire someone <laughs> like extremely hard they're pretty much there for life and so they have like a three month trial period where you get to see what they're like. Now, SDRs, I think it's more, um, more apropos because within the first, usually 60, 90 days, I'm going to get a good, draw, uh, a good feel of work ethic, acumen, like the interview them starts to wear off after a couple of weeks. So I get more of a feel of, of who they are, but account executives, it's going to be dependent upon the sale. But especially if you're talking about a longer tail sale that's like 90 days, you know, just as a sales cycle in general. And then you got to talk about building pipeline. You got to talk about they got to get to know the company. I don't think barring that you barring that you uh, see something really insane, like really bad behavior, discriminatory behavior, you know, like they're, they're giving massive leading indicators. I think it'd be a little too early to tell, especially for like an enterprise account executive, whether they're going to be successful or not. But SDRs, I'm certainly more more open to the idea. What Keenan. about you? What about you, Keenan? What are your thoughts on this one? I struggle. And I swing back and forth. So I have something 
that I use called the results behavior matrix. So imagine behaviors on the left, on the Y quadrant. Mm -hmm. Imagine results on the X axis. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Now imagine at the top of the behavior ones, it says yes. And the bottom it says no. And then to the right, it says yes to results. And to the left, it says no. So the bottom left box means you're not demonstrating the behaviors and you're not demonstrating or you're delivering on the results. Get rid of them less than 30 days if you can. Just fucking dump them. Dump them. If they're in the top right box, <clears throat> they're demonstrating the results and they're demonstrating all the right behaviors. Man, like shower them. Shower them with love, man. Give them hugs and kisses and, you know, shower them with love because they're the best employees you have. The difficult situations are when they're getting the results but not demonstrating the behaviors or they're getting the behaviors but they're not demonstrating the results. Those are the difficult ones. And unfortunately, far too often, that's where most people live. Blows mm -hmm. my mind. But so the answer is if it's early, early on and they're not demonstrating the behaviors and they're demonstrating results, which would be hard to believe. But let's say you have, low ball, you have a low bar, just things, you know, little milestones you have to make and they're hitting those, but they're not demonstrating the behaviors in the first 60 days. Get them the fuck out. Because they come in and they're already a behavioral issue where they're not following or blending into the culture or, or anything like that. then that's a problem. If you, you can't do that shit in your first 60 to 90 days. I, what, yeah. what are you doing? That's a choice, right? So bounce them. If they're demonstrating the right behaviors in the first 60 to 90 days, you're not getting results, mm -hmm. give them more time. Give them more time. Because mm -hmm. what they're showing is that they're committed and they're trying and they're doing all the activity and they're, they're playing the game and they're and, and, and embedding themselves into the culture, but they're just having a hard time getting that going. Okay, give them time because you want those people. Like Behaviors is a choice. Results isn't always a choice. It's an mm -hmm. outcome. Behaviors is a choice. So if someone's demonstrating all the behaviors, give them extra time. If they're not, bounce them. <clears throat> Got you. So the next sales myth of today is the best seller is an aggressive seller. Keenan, what are your thoughts on this one? What does everybody think I'm going to say? <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> this isn't a myth. Sometimes you're tough to call. Sometimes, I'm sometimes I'm you're I'm tough, tough to call. Sometimes you're tough to call, even for In what me. regard? What do you mean? Meaning, sometimes you su you surprise me on what direction you're going to go. That I was like, okay, I like that. I you know why I like that? Because that shows that I'm a thinker. And I don't just get into a path and stick to that path all the time. You know, that it's right? a sign of intelligence, number one. And statistically, men are three times more likely to change their mind than women. Isn't that crazy? Wow. I mean, That's, that is fascinating. Men, wow. Would you say it's men are finicky? Three times more likely, a likely than a woman. <laughs> wow. Men are finicky. Okay, so here's my answer. No, I don't think it's finicky. Keep going, though. Keep going. Okay, here's my answer. The answer is no. No, you don't have to be aggressive to sell. You have to have drive mm -hmm. and you have to have commit and you have to be determined and you have to be willing to challenge somebody, right? So, you know, I think to a lot of people it comes down to how one defines aggression, but you can, you don't need to be aggressive to do anything. You just don't. And so when we try to build these sales teams and they use words like aggression and stuff like that, it's unnecessary. Like, again, you have to be able to push, you have to be able to challenge, but you don't have to be aggressive. You don't have to be over the top. You don't have to be forceful. No, no. There are times and places that it may fit, but no, you do not have to be aggressive to be able to sell. All right. What are your thoughts, Beck? What do you think? I struggle. I'm right down the middle because I think that people normally, when they think of aggressive, they think of aggressive as in pushing them to close. And that, of course, I'm always a hard no. Like you shouldn't be pushing anyone to close. You, you yep. should be focused on diagnosing. Where I struggle with it and where I do think that it can be very, very helpful is being aggressive. A synonym for it, I was just looking it up, is determined. And so if I'm determined to diagnose, that's actually a really helpful thing. If I'm determined to study about my buyer, that's actually a really, uh, really helpful thing. In a lot of facets, I'm an aggressive person, meaning I'm going to aggressively study. I'm going to aggressively get something done. I'm going to aggressively focus on, on, on something. But I think in the traditional like parochial meaning of like, I'm going to be aggressive to close this person or send them follow-up emails and all of that. 
like all of that, of course, I'm a hard no. But if you're determined to get an initiative done and that initiative is truly diagnosing and finding out things that they didn't know or diagnosing quickly so that they can avoid something, I'm a hard yes. I And the last uh, sales myth of today is kind of tied into the second one, but your job as a salesperson is to sell. Beck, what are your thoughts on this one? Yeah. Um, I was thinking about this today whenever I was running. I think that most people, best case scenario, are selling. They're asking questions like a lawyer asks questions. A lawyer, their job is to prove something to someone else by way of asking mm. questions to a witness. So they're trying to not necessarily lead the person, but lead the jury to believe something based on the questions that they ask. Their static point is that this person is guilty or not guilty. And so they're trying to arrange questions in a certain way to get the witness to admit certain things so they can prove an agenda. And I believe that that's how salespeople are asking questions most of the time. You know, their agenda is they want to close them. So they're going to ask questions in a certain way to get the person to admit things about their pain or et cetera, you know, so that they can close. But if you transfer to your questions are to diagnose then I think questions can be an incredibly positive thing. So hard no, I don't think it's to sell. I think it is to match a solution, if there is one, to a problem that that person is having that is large enough that they need to solve it in the moment based on the level of impact combined with the present aggressive um, uh, pain in totality of the problem. That's my view. Hmm. What, what about you, Keenan? What are you thinking? Uh, no, it's not to sell. It's not to sell at all. Your job's to help. Your job's to help. So if you start with the helping mindset, mm -hmm. what's the very what's the very first thing that you need in to properly help somebody? You figure out what's going on with them. Yes. What's the one word for that? A diagnosis. Mm, no, close. That's what you have to do. A diagnosis. You have to understand. Diagnosis. You have to understand. Oh. You have to understand, right? You have to understand. That's what the diagnosing does is it helps you understand. So if you start with the premise that your job is not to sell but to help and you genuinely believe that you have to help, then your first step is what don't I know or how do I understand? How, how can I help? Mm -hmm. And then you start from there. Wow. Okay, hold up. Men doesn't have <laughs> Okay, and with that, Wait, really quick, Beck, Wait, where did you get the data that men change their mind three times more frequently than women? There was a study that I was reading this week. Did someone ask that in the comments? I'll have to not think in the comments, that. but yeah, it was a study that I was oh. Okay, I'll I'll get back to you, but there's a number of different psychology channels that I tune into. One very often is Todd Grande. He goes deep into is he big. <laughs> no, he's actually like this little like he's like, "Hello, my name is Todd Grande, and today we're going to dive into eight types of humor." And he's like, "Tiny." Min got it. Min got it. That no, was I great. did. I did. Oh, Grande, I got it. No, but he's like this. He's like, today we're going to go into this. And he talks about like really passionate topics. And he's like, so let's talk about when two people have an explosive argument. And I'm like, oh my God, this guy is a calculator. So I think it was on his channel, but I'll double back. I'll look through my, my history. Okay. And with that, okay, we so are. Greg Christensen said, you're hired to sell, but you achieve this by solving problems. Everyone has to hit a number, but there's more to it than the number. Oh, Greg, I love you, but I freaking hate those answers. They just, they, it's just a, an inaccurate reduction, okay? Mm -hmm. Yeah, you're hired to get a number. I got it. But if you think your job is to sell to get to that number, you're not getting it. You're not hearing us, mm -hmm. okay? That's the problem with sales. That's the problem with sales. Just because you're hired to sell doesn't mean that you, the way you sell has to be selling. If you're helping, by default, you will, let's look, Craig needs to understand this. Let me help you out, Greg. 
The whole concept of selling is influencing change. If you can't influence change, then they will not buy. And you do not influence change by telling people about shit or showing people shit. It doesn't work. The way you influence change is by helping people understand that their current state is untenable and intolerable. And once and only then do they determine that where I am now is not where I need to be or I'm unable to stay there. It is not consistent where I want to be. I've got to get out of this space. I will change. Then I will talk to you about what you're doing, where you, uh, what you're selling, or what your solutions are, but not until then. And even then, you got to convince me that it is worth that transition. So no, I don't know what else to say. It is about helping. And once you help, the sale will come. There we go. There we go. Yeah, Greg. <laughs> you're right. I agree with you, Keenan. That's what I meant, Keenan. Yes, yes, yes. Thank you, Greg. Thank you. Yeah, I just feel like I gotta. I just feel like I gotta change the way the world thinks. So I see, see things I can't leave it. The way people talk about sales, not Greg this time, but in general, is so whacked. And I see it every day, and it just drives me insane. So, anyways, my mission complete. Thank you for the clarification, Greg. You may continue, Min. There we go. Okay, with that, we are on to the next segment of this podcast, which is take it or leave it. This is the segment where I introduce common sales tactics and Keenan and Beck let us know whether they would take it or leave it. So the first one of my today. Favorite episode, my favorite section, segment, whatever you call it. My favorite one. Yes. Okay. The first one of today is sending gifts to prospects. Keenan, take it or leave it? Leave it. Leave it. Leave it. Nope. Don't be sending gifts. Now. The asterisk to that statement is I do support sending, I don't know, I don't want to call them gifts, but sending, for lack of a better, I'll go with, I'll stay right in the vernacular, right? It's sending gifts to prospects to get their attention um, to set a meeting. Now, it's a different conversation what those look like and what those should be, but I, I am taken for that. But to, to, to once they're in the cycle and have a relationship or they're actually an existing customer to send them gifts, no, not as part of the sales process. Obviously, if I have a relationship and I call them a friend or, you know, in my thing, that top right box, we're friends and we have credibility. Yeah. Okay. But that's a friend. But in, as a general practice, absolutely positively not. And as a way to drive the sale or no, absolutely not. All right. What about you, Beck? Uh, what do you think? Take it or leave it? I'm shocked. I have a dead on matched opinion to Keenan in this regard. Oh. Exact same opinion. Okay, well, you know what? In that case, we'll go straight into the next one. The next one is inviting prospects to events. Back, take it or leave it. I'm going to leave it. I mean, usually it's like a customer event, and it's like to thank our customers. It's like what? By boring them to death with a whole bunch of webinars on product releases that you could have just sent via an email. You know, it does put pressure on the prospect to show up. I don't think that it's usually a benefit to the prospect. I'm, I'm a, uh, yeah, and it's usually at the the agenda to get them to like talk to prospective customers if they are already a customer, so they can talk well about it. Just it seems a little sleazy to me, and it always kind of feels in that vein. So I'm a, I'm, I'm never like, oh, I can't wait to go to this event. <laughs> Oh, booyah, I get to go to a dinner with a whole bunch of prospects of, you know, a tool that I just bought. So I, I'm a leave it. All right, what about you, Keenan? Take it or leave it? Ooh. I don't pull this out very often. It's a teave it. I think it's a teave it. Here's <laughs> why. Now, here's why. Because I, I, I was a leave it, and then I thought of a couple things. And I have ex experience to show these actually work. So... We need more context, but as the question was asked, it is a leave it for let's go golfing or to a ball game or something like that. Okay. Now, again, barring like an invitation to the fucking Masters, right? Like, or a Super Bowl, right? If you got, if you have access to the Super Bowl and you can get the CEO of one of your biggest customers to go with you, you, you take that. Like, you take that and you run. Okay. So that's why I'm sort of a, a, a team on that. There are, there are exceptions to this rule, like I before E, right? The other one is, a properly done customer event. And that's why I started drifting to leave it because I used to work for a company that every year they would they would um, take all of their customers, all of them, to the opening day baseball game. And it became a thing. 
right? So mm-hmm. when they started, it was like, I don't make this up. They had like 30 customers and they would take them. And then they had 50, they had 100, 500, 1,000. They would keep buying seats and they would keep, people would keep coming. It was obviously, how do you say, uh, uh, it was choice. Like it was, it was optional. But everybody would get an invitation. They'd have a huge, they'd have a huge party out front. They started, you know, bring this event. They made an event. People could bring their kids and family, right? And so they were known for this. They were known for this. So the public publicity and exposure, and then it drove the culture of the company. You know what I'm saying? Like, like there, there wasn't like any. They weren't put, like Bex Point. They weren't passing out. You know, do work with us and and, and pamphlets. No, it was just coming have a freaking great time. So I got to be the team. It there are some situations where done right can have some, some substantial benefit. I the last uh, take it or leave it for today is adding your VP of Sales or CRO to the demo call. Uh, Keenan, take it or leave it. Leave it. All right, perfect. Back, take it or leave it. <laughs> I'm oddly enough to leave it too. <laughs> we're, we're in one accord today. They usually. They think they add value, but usually they distract from the deal and they just talk the whole time. <laughs> so I find more objections to get them off the call a lot of times. <laughs> ding, 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 ding. I'm going to get you. CTOs, CTOs. And then they want to be like, in December, in the cold winter of December 12th of 1949, we thought that we had a problem. I'm like, kill me now. Oh my God, just kill me now. And I had to find a respectful way to be like, how do I get homeboy to shut the up? Like, it blew my deals. It blew my deals. So I would just, you know, stop putting them in my calendar invites because I'm like, nope. He's going to want to come in and I'm going to have to play the game and I can't do it anymore. I can't have any more cold December nights. <laughs> <laughs> okay. With that, we are on to the next segment of this podcast. Nobody's offered any questions either. No one's asked any it's questions. It's all good. I have two. Uh, right. Even though we don't have the mailbox, I I brought the mailbox to, to y'all. It's okay. Well, good for men. You can ask me go, men. any question you want, y'all. Literally any question. I'm this sure. is a gold. Nobody's out. taking it. <laughs> Nobody's <laughs> taking it. Don't you worry. This next question is going to be a doozy. What what is a guilty pleasure of his? The sky's the limit. Greg, Greg asked a question. He said, "Wait, do you hold think up? Hold up! I got I got to do my thing." Okay, we're on to my favorite section of this podcast, which is hold up. Uh, the inbox. There we go. <laughs> So we're putting in we put a new updated segment intro, so some of the times it's a little bit glitchy. But this is my favorite segment where Keenan and Beck answer questions from our audience. Now you said Greg had a question. Yes, Greg had a question. He said, When would you change VP? I guess ask a VP on a call. It says, When would you change a VP on a call? But I guess when you ask or take a VP on a call, ask whatever he's trying to say. So what do you think, Keenan? What when is there a good time to put a CR on the call? Yeah, I think there's a I think I think there is. And I think it's when um if they want someone higher up to yeah. come on the call and it's questions or something like that. So we'll talk like a peer-to-peer environment. Or if they're a uh, uh there's someone at the decision making process that's at a higher level um that doesn't necessarily talk with the salesperson on a regular basis, then there could be some value in bringing them in on that executive call, that senior call, or if there is a formal um, presentation or a formal last call where all their stakeholders will be on it. I think there's, depending on the VP, there's value of bringing that person on. Oh, what about you, Beck? What do you think? Yeah, well, I, I was thinking if they requested, like Keenan asked, like they said, like, hey, we want, we want, you know, zero to be there. But it made me shudder a little bit because if they're doing that, it's usually because they don't think that you have enough credibility, number one. And number two, there's a lot of situations that are ringing through my head of, let's call it the the stereotype of when they would do that, and it just makes it irks me a little bit. Um, but I, that that would be the only time I'd really consider it. Or if, like Keenan mentioned, like you're going into an enterprise deal, it's an on-site, and they're going to have 15 people from their team, and you just need more bodies. Like you need more bodies to be there for. I don't know. That's when I would consider it. 
Got you. So the the first question from uh, the first audience submission uh, for the inbox is from Shahriyar Sultan. If I if I butcher the name, I'm sorry. Uh-oh. But uh, he asked, "Is there a methodical way to apply gap selling when doing discovery?" Keenan, I'm gonna lead you lead uh, with you. What do you think? My first, I wish my man whose name you can't pronounce. If it is a man her, his name, we're on the call because my first question would be methodical. How are you defining methodical? And in the absence of him explaining it or someone explaining it to me, I'm going to say no because I'm going to in, uh, interpret methodical as a method. I'm going to go back. If you look in the dictionary, a method is a set of steps to perform something over and over and over. And the answer to that is absolutely not because The way gap selling works is you ask them a question and you listen to their answer. And then based on their answer, you must ask follow on questions. So if anything, it's the method is a giant if then. And there's actually a term for it. I forgot. It's a certain type of diagnosis that allows this to happen. So, no, you cannot bring a a method to gap sell to to discovery and gap selling. Beck, uh, you have any uh, thing to add to this? Do I get to add to it or no? Of course. (laughs) It's opinion show, Beck. The way, the way, uh, way my brain works. They're gonna, they're gonna lead with something, and it's gonna be different in a lot of cases. It's gonna be maybe it's a root cause that's self-diagnosed. Maybe it's a problem that's self-diagnosed. Maybe it's a solution that they have in mind that's self-prescribed. And I'd be looking to get my arms around that and then pivot to the other items. So it's more of a method. Now, I agree with Keenan around the questions. Like, you can't know exactly finitely what questions because you don't know how they're going to lead. But if they say, like, we need sales training, and I'm like, okay, there's a self-prescribed solution. I'm like, why do you say that? And I would go anchor in around KPIs because I'm wanting to uncover the self-diagnosed problem. And then once I have that, I'm trying to go to the self-diagnosed root causes if there are any. And my second echelon of steps would be around, or questions that I'm asking, is around building my own diagnosis and challenging a difference if there is one. So that's the method that's in my head. Now, my to me, experience- that's an approach. Yeah, well, it's a method. Like, in my head, I'm like, okay, if they led with root cause, you know, what they think, they're like, we need better cold emails, you know, for instance. I'm like, okay, so I have the self-diagnosed root cause. I need to go a little bit deeper and define that more of what they mean by, you know, like what's the current quality today, you know, and are there any other root causes? But I know what item like that I need to pivot. Oh, did we hit the bell already? Ding, ding, ding. <laughs> right. Yeah, I gave you a couple of seconds, but it's okay. Here's the new rule. You have to do it on the double zero. And if, and if we want to go past, we have to go. You have to do it on the okay. double zero for okay. both of us. For both I thought you would like it because I was talking about gap. I, I, it's not that I don't like it. I just want us to be, you know, come uh, back. For sure. I'll be a stickler for talk, the rule. If we want to keep talking, we got to do it on the double zero. Got you. Perfect. Perfect. Well, in that case, well, for now, we're going on to the next segment of this podcast which is the challenge. There we go. Okay. There you go. This is the segment where Keenan and Beck break down a challenging subject within the sales industry. And the challenge for today is how to coach an underperforming rep. Uh, so let's start out with uh, Beck. Why don't you start us out with this one? Oh, well, uh, did you mean SDR or AE? Um, let's go with uh, AE. AE? So if they're not hitting quota, how do you coach the underperforming rep? Yeah. So, well, I'll, I'll lead uh, in a way, and then we, we can take it a different direction at the end. But the first thing that you need to do do in my opinion is to understand uh what they're doing incorrectly so you have to take a look at so the difference to me between coaching and training is training is teaching someone how to do it and coaching is identifying where they're falling short and then 
displaying what they're doing to them, what they should do instead so that you can make up the gap. So a great example is, let's say that, um, you know, within the gap methodology, for instance, let's say, you know, Keenan trains through how to identify the current state, the problem, the root cause, current impact, future impact, you know, solution and the gap to the future state of where they want to go. And he trains it to 15 people. Some people are going to miss the concept of how do they uncover the root cause. Some people are going to miss the piece of how to uncover the future state of where they want to go. Some people are going to stop at pain and not go to problem, but it's going to be different from, for every person. So the training is him teaching them, but the coaching is identify where they're going wrong in their unique specific instance to get them to move forward accordingly. So I'd say the first step is to identify, and this can be through call review. This can be through uh, looking at their cold emails. I don't think enough people are. Most people that I know don't know what the hell the reps are doing. Honestly, they don't log into their outreach instance. They don't see how many emails they sent. They don't see what emails they sent at all. And I know that because every time I show their rep, uh, show people the amount of activity their reps have and what their activity looks like, they almost self-correct. They're like, holy crap, well, I didn't know this. And I'm like, well, that's the problem. You should be looking into that. But the first step, I digress, is to identify what that person is doing wrong in specific. Keenan, what, what about you? Keenan, what do you think? Burn them at the stake. <laughs> <laughs> they'll get it straight. Fucking tie them up to that stake and they'll get their shit together in a hurry. Probably. No. Probably. Um, so, I, look, this is a lot here. So, um, I think the first thing is you got to get acknowledgement. And I'll do a little bit and pass it back to back. But you got to get acknowledgement that they're not performing. That's the first thing you got to do, right? They don't admit they're not performing, then you got a problem. So either you didn't set the proper goals and they didn't understand the goals, or they're just being, they're living in denial in the river in Egypt. So, you know, either one of those is a problem. You have to address that accordingly. But once you get them to acknowledge that they're not performing, you got to then understand what Beck said, why? Okay, so then that's where I go back to the, four quadrant matrix we talked about earlier, right? So I'll, I'll plot on that. Where are they? I will literally plot them on there. Mm -hmm. And if, as long as they're not in that bottom quadrant, then coaching comes along. And even if they're on the bottom quadrant, depending on what, there'll be a little bit of coaching. So, um, you know, one of the things I like to do is test the concept of effort. Cause I've usually found when people are underperforming, a lot of these challenges around effort and everybody has a different scenario of what effort is, right? They do. Everybody's got not a scenario. They've got a different interpretation of what effort is. Mm -hmm. I remember like many, many years ago, I wrote a post and I should pull it out because it's one of my favorite. We live in a society. Think about this for a second, everybody. We live in a society that um, chastises um, too much work, overworking, working too much. Right. We chastise people for that concept or people ask us to do that, but then celebrate the Results. greatest people. <laughs> yes. So they say so what triggered this for me was Tiger Woods. Right. Yeah. When he's done planting. Now, granted, he's done his career or whatever. When he's when he back in his heyday, when he was done with a round of golf at a championship or major, it didn't matter. He would go to the driving range, hit one thousand balls. Best in the world, worth billions of dollars or hundreds and hundreds of millions of dollars. Nike contracts, he'd never pick up a club again in his life and not worry about money. So there's no mo money motivator there. There's not, right? So he would put in that work. There are most people who want to be, who quote unquote, want to be good golfers who won't hit a thousand balls at all. Like, like go there to the drainage and hit a thousand balls. They maybe hit two buckets. There's maybe what, 50 balls, 75 balls in a bucket. They'll do 150 balls, be there for a half hour, an hour and be like, all right, I did good today. And they'll go home. So one of the things I do to people in these situations when they're not performing is I say, all right, I want, and this is the behavior aspect of it. I say to them, do you think you're working hard? Yes. All right. You think you're putting in a nice effort? Yes. All right. Let me ask you this question. If by September 15th, if you didn't hit your goal, you would die. Mm -hmm. What would you do different? And you can't tell people you're going to die. You can't lie. You can't cheat. You can't manipulate. So it still has to be the same thing you're doing now. What would you do different? And let me tell you how much more creative people are, how much more they work, how many more calls to make, how more organized they'd be, because now their life is on the line. Mm -hmm. 
So I don't expect people to work every single day like your life is on the line. That's untenable. But what it shows you is the space between how you're actually working and how much more you're leaving on the table and lean in just a half of that or a quarter of that or two thirds of that. And so those are the types of conversations I have. So I'll leave it at that. And then I have a process I'll share in a second after Beck goes. Well, I couldn't echo strongly enough what you're saying. And I think that we demonize people who work hard, but then to your point, Steph, That's Curry, the word I was looking for. Thank you. Steph Curry hits a three pointer and we're like, he's the moon. And I'm like, well, yeah. dude, do you know how much practice that took? And so I'm like, yeah. please, when I see people doing that, I usually see people projecting their mediocre standards onto other people to get them to slow down because they don't want to run as hard. And I'm like, yeah. I can't tell you how many people who have been like, Oh, Beck, you work so hard, blah, blah. And I'm like, that's my pace. That's the pace that I want to go because I'm like, the race to be an expert in anything is 10,000 hours. So I'm like, if I do eight hours a day versus one hour a day, like, and that's up to me. Like, now I do think that there are work standards, but in my opinion, and I'm probably going to get blown up and land on CNN for all the wrong reasons for this, but I'm like, I don't think people work hard enough, in my opinion. I oh, think yeah, no, no question. They like carry around, carry around the um, like, oh, I don't work hard enough. I'm not good enough. And I'm like, if you just supplanted all that mental energy by just going out the door and going on the run or doing whatever it was, like you would solve most of your problems. So I think people give themselves far too many excuses. They're like, oh, well, you know, it's raining today. And I'm like, well, you still can run even though it's raining back. Mm-hmm. You know, and when I don't do that, it's like own up to that too. And so I, I, I think we are breeding a culture of like, oh, it's okay, you tried, <laughs> like mm-hmm. you tried, and it's just causing. I worry about this subject a lot. I know that we're on coaching, but I worry about this subject a lot. That I'm like, you shouldn't hold someone back whenever they do want to get better at something. I'm like, for instance, right now I need to learn French. It's 580 hours until you're fluent. I've covered 200 since I've been here. Why? Because I freaking want to learn French and not look like an idiot anymore. That's I, want to be able to, I want to be able to order coffee. And so I'm like, I'm staying up at night. I'm walking around. I'm tripping and I'm falling and I'm looking dumb in everyday conversations. But I'm trying to make my way there because I want to do that. So it's like saying, oh, okay, well, a normal person would only study an hour a day. And I'm like, I don't think I'm better than everyone else in that. I don't think I'm worse. I'm like, I just want to hit that clip more early you know, than this pre-recommended plan. So point being, yeah, my opinion in a nutshell is we don't work hard enough <laughs> from what I've seen. I'm like, just stop talking, stop giving all your yip yap and go outbound. Stop talking it talking, stop giving all your yip yap and just go read about it. Go figure out how to do it. It's my, I should have saved this for the rant. Point being the second step in my head, <laughs> in my opinion is to, and I, I, I will give attribution here. I learned this from Keenan. Once you understand and have observed what they're doing incorrectly, a very important step is to describe to them what they're doing that's incorrect. Because otherwise, in a lot of cases, they won't know. That's my second step. Keenan. Thank you. That's what I was going to cover. I was really going to go into the obdra- ob- observe, describe, describe. Prescribe. <laughs> yes. Absorb and apply. So yes, that's that's my coaching framework. You got to find observable moments. That's why I'm a big fan of Gong. You know, big fan of um, Chorus. That's an observable moment. So I'm also a big fan of Noted Analytics, which allows you to see, observe the outcomes of the data that the reps capture in a call inside of Salesforce in easy fashion. So that allows you to describe what you see, and then allows you to say, all right, these are some prescriptions that I would do differently. And then you observe their absorption. Did they get it? And then you see if they're applying it, wash, rinse, repeat. Ding, 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 ding. We are done with this segment. Uh, Right on schedule. Uh, Now on to the last segment of this podcast, which is... Oh, listen, just one more thing. Perfect. Didn't say it, did it? Just one more thing? I didn't hear it. It had a, a, unless I'm mistaken, it should have had the audio of Columbo saying, oh, just one more. Oh, thing. yeah. Well, I heard something, but I couldn't hear it here. But yeah, okay. Yeah. Good work. Uh, well, this segment is uh, where Beck and Keenan share with us what's on their mind and give us their closing thoughts. 
So the first one to uh, for the first one to give their just one more thing should is Beck this week. So Beck, what is your one more thing? Well, I think I I was going to give Keenan the option. Your two choices are I double down on accountability, or I can talk about uh, where I think the industry is headed and influencers' responsibility in that mix and what I'm worried about. Your gentleman's the first, choice. The first one. The first one. Yeah. I'll go another minute on it, and then I'm going to pass. You're either going to be left at the end of your life with results or excuses. Ooh. Mm. You really are. And you know those excuses weren't real. Just like I know when I'm saying them. I didn't learn French before I came here. Why? I made excuses. And I'm paying for it now. I'm paying for it now. I should have been doing that. And I think you do yourself more of a disservice in taking the time to generate those excuses than just saying nothing. So it's like, I see this in a thousand different ways. I see it in a thousand different playouts for myself included. Again, I certainly am not perfect. This is a huge example of it. I knew that I was moving here for months and I had the Rosetta Stone course that I didn't have the time to do it. Why? Because I didn't make the time to do it. And I told myself that. So in a nutshell, excuses affect the person who's giving them more than anyone else because you know when they weren't real and you know when it was just you rattling off some reason to justify whatever you're doing and in most cases you are not doing. You are not outbounding. You are not making those calls. You didn't read. You didn't do your homework. You didn't whatever. And so my, my plea is to not do what I did and to just look at that dead on and to make a plan and not spend the time giving yourself the heartburn of just coming up with all the reasons why you couldn't do something to convince someone else of why you weren't able to do it. It's bizarre. Convince yourself to convince they, yourself. Yeah. They don't believe you anyway. Let me roll the tape forward. And you don't believe it yourself when you look in the mirror. But, 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 but this is hundred percent, but I'm going to disagree with the last piece. I think people have actually convinced themselves. Which is and that's, more dangerous. Yeah, no, that's my point. Like, they've actually convinced themselves. They, they believe their own rhetoric. I think the people who know they're making excuses sometimes move like you did. You got there and you're like, I got to stop this, right? So you were on that, that line, one foot in, one foot out. But I think most people, when they make those excuses, 90% they take to their grave with full belief embedded in their psyche that they were screwed. Because that story had to be told over and over and over where they couldn't live with they themselves. Believe it. So yeah, dangerous. They have to believe it. So dangerous and everything. Mm -hmm. Everything. It's just like own it, identify what you want, go after it, or don't, but stop talking. Stop talking about it. Okay? Go do it or don't and own it. <laughs> Either way, that's my rant. All right, Keenan, what about you? What's your one more thing? One last thing. So it will be nothing as powerful and as, as um, inspiring as Bex. So, um, but with that, I was playing with ChatGPT today. And mm -hmm. I think most of you know this and most of you don't. I don't know. I don't know if you know this or not. But ChatGPT stop it, its data stops in September of two of 2019. 2019. So if you want anything that's come since then, basically four years now or three and a half years, she or her or it or him or whatever, don't pull from it. So I think that's a problem. Because basically it's dealing with someone who's dealing with old information. Now look, all the different uses I think are great, right? Especially a lot of the Greg Christian, you say 2021, but it chat GP literally just told me. Hold on. I think I oh I deleted it. This something I don't know. <laughs> yeah, it, it, I, it told me, said, hey, I'm sorry. 
I'm only up to September 2019, but I digress. Maybe it is 20. No, it's 2019 is what it told me. So I can't remember. It doesn't matter. The point being is it's old data. So when you ask it certain things, like you say, like, what is the best car I should be looking at? Or, you know, you're asking for its opinion. It's only going to give you opinion on data that was in there that's two to three years old or even four years old. That's not good. That's not good. So as much and, and so as much as we are excited about it and we're driving it places and I'm a fan, be careful about how you use it. Mm-hmm. And then what it also got to me, though, what no one's talking about, and I'd love anybody's insight, is I want to understand how to train this thing. Mm-hmm. I think I personally think that is the biggest value is learning how to train this thing. Because I ran a search, who are the top sales influencers? Mia Gap Selling didn't show up. So then I asked her or hit or whatever, why? And it said, well, because these Gap influencers were, you know, I mean, sorry, these sales influencers had these traits. No, I said these traits. I said, well, how did you come up with that criteria? Like I did, I did a, yeah. a Gap Selling this thing. How did you come up with the criteria? And it gave me some stupid answer. And then I said, why doesn't it include Keenan? And then it said, um, uh, Keenan's really good. And then it gave up my name. It said Keenan CH, also known as CHP. I said, who's Keenan CHP? And it says he's a certified financial planner. I said, no, he's not. And I said, oh, thanks for the correction. Then I asked the correct question again later and said I was a CS, it said I was a financial planner again. So it's got shit wrong. Yeah. It's mm-hmm. got shit wrong. And yeah, he's because I actually got in a fight with I did I, the I same thing. I did the same thing about personalization at scale in Beck Holland. And I was like, you're wrong. Mm-hmm. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, mm-hmm. so I want, the same yeah. person. So just keep in mind two things. One, when you run the searches that you ask me, keep in mind that it's not up to date. And number two, if you're if you're serious about this, pay close attention. Or if someone knows how to do it, the winners are those people who can influence it. I'm already looking at chat like Google. This Google, well, Google's coming up with their own, but they should be freaking out because fewer and fewer people are going to go to Google to figure something out. They're going to go to chat. Right. To find out information and then they can just go get that information. Right. Like what's the best sales book? People write, put that in Google right now. Right. So there's going to be an SEO concept. I mean, let's call it concept for chat GPT. How do I get this thing to, to spew out stuff about me, my company, um, my sales methodology, et cetera, that is accurate in one and two makes me look better or puts me in the top searches or gives me more exposure. How do you do that? <clears throat> Mm-hmm. Cause that's what people are going to want to do. Mm-hmm. And well, that's our podcast. Yes. Oh, by the way, Greg, I asked the question. I said, do, how do you learn? And do you add new information thinking as I give it new information, it does something with it. And she came, it came back and said, no, I don't. I can only pull the information from 2019. So we'll tell you it's learning, but if you go back and ask the question again, it'll repeat the original wrong answer. I looked anyway. at uh, metrics. So I said metrics for a marketer and it got them wrong or a sales rep or SDR and got them wrong. And I had to learn how to basically code on what words to say. It took me four or five tries to actually get the correct metrics. Now go back and ask it again. I bet it gives it to you the first way it did the first time. It doesn't store it. It doesn't store it. At least it didn't for me. I thought I was training it a little. Then I went back Mm -hmm. and asked the question again. And it told me my name was because it said, oh, you're right. The name isn't Keenan CHP. Like, go to bed, Jim. <laughs> it said, yeah, it said, thanks for that piece of information. And then when I asked who the author of Gap Selling was, it said Keenan, Keenan CHP. It went right back to what I just told it wasn't. That's what and I after, it, after it acknowledged that it was it was wrong. That's so what I would have said back. I've been like, it's 2 a.m., Jim. Go to bed. <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. Um, okay, everybody. You've been listening to the sales podcast. Oh, my God. I'm tired. Now i got to go do a training right now. I'm one minute late. Y'all have been listening to... The Sales Top to Bottom Podcast. I'm your host, Keenan. And I'm back. Au revoir, everyone. Bonsoir. Peace out.